morning, everyone. Welcome to Boise, Idaho. It's no Dubai, but it'll do. Du- <laughs> Dubai. Huh? Is that a dad joke for you? We're here at bodybuilding.com headquarters. Uh, I'm Nick Coleus, an editor in this August establishment. Uh, to my right is Heather Eastman, another editor and uh, former physique maven. Ooh, physique maven. That's a good one. <laughs> And then across the way, um, over to the west, we have none other, none other than Abel Albonetti. He's Hi, joining everyone. us here. Uh, <laughs> you love him for his abs. I hate him for his hair. He is a bodybuilding.com and muscle tech athlete, men's classic physique competitor. Not classic, no, classic? men's physique. Men's physique. Okay, men's physique, but you, yeah. you do, okay. And um, everybody tells me, also one of those guys you see on the page or you see on your phone and then you see him in person, you go, oh, you're you're bigger than I thought you were. <laughs> Do you hear that a lot? That's always good to hear, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, he is the star of a new program here on bodybuilding.com, All Access, 30 Days to Your Best Abs, I believe it is That is called. correct. Yeah. And that's what he's been here shooting, among many other things. Among we put out things. a ton of workouts with these, this guy. Um, now... We did a few. Uh, we did like a profile v- video of you a few years ago, sort of the, f- the fitness 360, yeah. as we mm-hmm. used to do those, where we got into your backstory a little bit, just to tell you know where you came from and how you started. But I wanted to touch on that a little bit for people who haven't seen that video because it's not the same old like, hey, I hurt myself playing high school football oh, and right. decided yeah, the, to lift all the, the time video, stores, yeah. right? Right. So, so you know, yeah. What what got you started in the gym in the first place? This is in your home, is my understanding, right? Yeah, I was in my home. Uh, well, I grew up. I'm one out of twelve brothers and sisters, so well, huge family. And so my dad had like a weight equipment when I was like 13 years old. He mm-hmm. brought it down from the attic, and I started working out from there. And it was really just friends coming over. We're trying to see who could bench press the most and all that stuff, like mm-hmm. most people mm-hmm. start off with. And then around 17, 18 years old. Uh, I was homeschooled my whole life as well. So, but being it was ho- still a large class. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's a full class. <laughs> so, like, oh, you think of you think of- <laughs> yeah. Uh, but being homeschooled, you're not able to go out there and play high school sports. So I was not able to go out there and play football, baseball, all that stuff. So what I did was after I got done with school, I had a part time job, and we lived out in the country. So if I wanted to go anywhere, the grocery store to a gym, I'd have to drive at least thirty minutes to forty minutes. But I had a part time job that was around forty five minutes away from my house. So right when I got done. Uh, working, I would go straight to the gym. Mm -hmm. And so during the time when all my friends are playing football or baseball, Mm -hmm. I would be, you know, in the gym working out and stuff. And so I started working out seriously when I was around 17 years old. And then uh, about that time, if we want to go into kind of how I got started Mm -hmm. into the modeling aspect, I was at the gym and this guy that came up to me, uh, he constantly came up to me. He was an agency in Memphis. I lived Mm -hmm. in Memphis, Tennessee at the time. And he would constantly come up to me at the gym. Was like, "Hey, man, if uh, you know you need to do modeling, you need to look into modeling. I could, you know, get you jobs here." But I, you know, I heard that honestly a lot, and I was like, "Okay, I, you know, I just didn't really want to do that." And um, long story short, he finally got me to go into his agency down in Memphis, and I went in there, and uh, he, you know, told me, promised me the world I could do this, right. do that, you know, go to New York, all this stuff. And I was like, "Whatever, whatever." And so I. Ended up doing uh, some runway stuff for Dillard's and Macy's and stuff down there. Actually on the runway? Uh, Well, it was in Memphis. So it was not like, you know, New York or anything. Yeah, exactly. No, it was like local stuff. On the the actual runway. Yeah, it was on a runway. Yeah. yeah. And so I did that and it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, So from there, I started up my social medias, um, like Facebook. That's when Facebook pages just went live and stuff. So it was just getting started. So I started that and... I knew I wanted to do something in the fitness industry. I wasn't sure, you know, mm-hmm. what the really. Fence on, on yeah, fashion. I'm on the exactly because I was doing, uh, you know, I was doing the runway stuff and I was doing kind of like photo shoots. Mm-hmm. And when I turned, I think, 20 years old is when I started doing clothing lines for, um, you know, like Rue 21, uh, just different like teenage clothing lines, right. and. Big bangs, I remember back then. Yeah, I had the Justin Bieber hair. Uh-huh. The, the Bieber Justin hair, Bieber yes. hair. And that was my look for a while, even in the <laughs> fitness industry. I mean, I had that hair for like four or five years afterwards. Because like everyone was like, Justin Bieber. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what I was called back then. It was before Justin Bieber, so it was like the Zac Efron look. You were, you were right, the Bieber right. before Bieber. <laughs> exactly, he copied me. Uh-huh. But so you know, from there, uh, you know, I was doing the clothing lines. My last clothing line, the people flew me out. It was exactly what you said. You're bigger in person, so mm-hmm. I tried to fit into these clothes, and they're like, you know, you're getting too big. You know, uh-huh. so uh, I had to make a decision as far as if I wanted to keep working out hard to you know go into the more fitness uh, world. And so I love working out. So I was like, no, I want to, you know, do something else. So about that time I was looking into fitness modeling because, um, it was people like Greg Plitt that I would research, you know, pull up. And he was like the first one that I like looked up to Mm -hmm. because before that it was all, you know, the only people that was making it in the industry was people like, you know, Jay Cutler, the huge bodybuilders, the massive, massive guys. And I never wanted to look like that. I mean, I liked, you know, I I looked up to people like that, but I knew I did not want to look like that. Uh, That wasn't what I, you know, that wasn't a goal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I started looking into more research, like, you know, Greg Plitt, looking in the magazines, bodybuild.com, doing research and, you know, found people that was seemed to be making it, you know, in the industry, just being, you know, a good looking guy Mm -hmm. uh, that looked obtainable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I decided, you know, to do that. So I kind of just kind of switched over completely from the clothing lines to doing more fitness. And from there, um, I worked with some agencies in New York to do um, different campaigns for different model and stuff. So I went out to New York, stayed out there for like four weeks doing, um, you know, really just photo shoots for my portfolio. Um, and then about that time was a big photo shoot that I flew down to Miami. It was a big uh, fitness photographer. He shot like all the main people. And so I flew myself out there, did a photo shoot. And from there, he started posting my photos. And at that time, uh, everything started blowing up, like my social medias and stuff. And from those photo shoots, just alone, my Facebook grew to Mm -hmm. basically almost 2 million and all that stuff just kind of slowly, you know, gained traction from that. Mm Um, have you have you had any more mainstream fashion sort of catch up with you ever again? Where it's like you know maybe maybe you're not too big for us anymore. Maybe mm-hmm. our ch- tastes have changed. Uh, not for the most part. No, not, and I haven't done anything with like you know that. I mean, I did after that. Like I think when I was like 25. Right now I'm 29 years old. So when I was like 25, so I was in, well into the fitness world i did some campaigns for like so i was a sheik's commercial it's like mm. a brand of sheets like mm. performance yeah, sheets yeah. and i was in people magazines sheets. yeah perform it was it i was in people magazines exist. for that and stuff <laughs> what what's what performance is going on in these sheets <laughs> <laughs> i have no idea but use your imagination <laughs> <laughs> but i did stuff like that but uh-huh. besides that i never did anything because to be um runway stuff do fashion you know they want people that are six foot one Mm -hmm. and for me being you know 511 too short to do true runway stuff Mm -hmm. uh so that's why i never even really looked into it much because anytime i did before they even the uh, agencies and stuff were like you're just too short to go just flat out runway stuff they just don't want that i guess that's true yeah i hear that about yeah well well. and you also can't fit into the clothes like they just yeah, they're not made for it's people not like and that's one my size. Mm-hmm. Like guys that are working out around here, because you know, obviously, we've got mm-hmm. bodybuilders in the building, and they can't find clothes to fit. Right. I mean, even though the industry has changed as far as you know, people like even Barbie dolls, you know, they all have muscles now. Right. But in the fashion world, it's still the case that it's like the slimmer guys that's mm-hmm. not have tons of muscle that are tall still do all the runway and the clothing lines. That's mm-hmm. just the way it is still. So it's I don't know when that's going to change. Right. You know, later on, it probably hmm. will. But right now, it's still about the same. I think it's yeah. interesting to hear you say that, you know, yeah, you had you had a gym at home. There maybe was a line for the bench press station on, on, ch- on interna- <laughs> International <laughs> Chess Day when there's 12 people in the family. But you had you had to travel to get mm-hmm. to the gym. You had to really want to go there. Oh, yeah. What, mm-hmm. did, the, what did that place represent to you at that point or what was what was the what was the allure of that aside from just like you know I enjoy doing it you had to have a reason to go there yeah I mean the first when I initially started going to the gym I wanted to be you know a bigger guy I wanted to beat my friends because I was always an athletic person Mm -hmm. and so I love an outlet yeah I was just there to really just kind of show up my friends honestly Mm -hmm. and it was at that point uh that you know, I decided, you know, going and stuff, but I found that I love doing it. And to this day, I mean, I tell people that 
you know, even if I didn't see any results in the gym as far as physical, a lot of people don't believe me, but I mean, I honestly tell you the truth that I would still be going Mm -hmm. even if I did not, you know, see results physically um, as far as looks and stuff, because I just love going in there. It's, I mean, it's it's just what I love doing now. And so it it turned into that, you know, at first it wasn't. At first it was, you know, going to the gym to look better or to, you know, for my friends to be stronger than my friends. But, you know, later on, maybe when I, when I got addicted to it, maybe six months to a year into working out, then it turned into something completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who who did you learn from at that time? Like what? I've never had a coach or anything. It was honestly just doing research from magazines and bodybuild.com. I used to read every article on bodybuild.com that anything that came up, I would read. I was on body space a whole lot. So uh, that's how I learned everything. I've never had a coach Taking or anything. Workouts just and trying it. And see yeah. Just it trying it out. And really, uh, you know, I was one of those people that would honestly <laughs> I would just about do too much. Mm-hmm. You know, I would be I in the gym <laughs> for, you know, two to two and a half hours, you know, just because I wanted, I knew that if I wanted to be where the person that I was looking up to, if I wanted to be where he is, I wanted to get there faster than what he did. And so I thought in my mind, if I stayed in the gym, you know, two to two and a half hours, you know, working that much harder, I could Mm -hmm. get there quicker. And, you know, for the most part, I think that did help me a whole lot. You know, maybe I did too, too, you know, did do too much at first, but you know that mindset I think helped me a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And then you just come home and crush the pantry, eat the eat the family out of house and home. Oh yeah, I used to eat <laughs> so much food. My mom and dad were like, "Oh my god, what are you doing? Where are <laughs> yeah. you going? You come back so hungry." <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a brother until I was seven years old, so it was a lot of girls, girls. in between there. Oh, okay. It's seven girls and five boys. In my family. So I was kind of getting outnumbered there. And then uh-huh. when that boy came up, I was like, oh, thank goodness. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Spotter, <Yes>. finally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, I'm glad you brought up the kind of overdoing it because we look at some of your workouts and we're like, geez, this is going to kill somebody because it's a Even lot to this of, day, I still do tons of, tons, tons of volume. Tons of volume. And you're kind of, your workouts are kind of known for volume. Yeah, and they so, are. Was that something that you just did from the get go, or is that something that you learned through trial and error? Like, did you start off, like you said, you'd read an article and say, okay, I'm just going to do these five exercises, three sets, you know? Yeah, I mean, of course, when I was uh, getting started in, uh, you know, working out stuff, I didn't know a lot about anything. The only thing that I really knew how to do was pretty much chest exercises. And it, the reason why I knew how to do that is because. Uh, it was actually a Bruce Lee movie. They did a some kind of documentary on him, and it was a guy that was playing Bruce Lee, and he they showed him going to the gym, doing like flies, bench press, and all that stuff. And he was the only one that actually saw videos um, doing the workouts. And so from there, I kind of learned how to do you know the flies and stuff because the training montage. Yeah, because my awesome. family was in a very um, there they grew. Uh, I grew up in a very strict family, and we didn't have. TV or we didn't have internet until I was, um, I think 18 years old. So anytime I needed to watch anything on, you know, YouTube, I have, I would have to go to the library. So Mm -hmm. if I was like reading stuff off bodybuilding.com, I'd go to the library, print it all off. But as far as like looking up videos on how to do stuff, I didn't do that because I didn't have the time. So I didn't have like YouTube to watch. So the only really workouts I had was just through that Bruce Lee video. So I learned kind of from there how to do different exercises. Um, But, you know, people that just getting into the gym, I would not recommend doing the volume that I do right now. Mm -hmm. The videos that I produce from bodybuilding.com and on my own channel are for people. It's my workouts. So it's like, you know, people that's been working out, I've been working out for, you know, 12 plus years, you know, really hard. And so if someone that was new to the gym goes in there and does my exact workouts. Yeah, you're going to be overdoing it because (laughs) your body's not used to that. Uh, You know, you have to build your body up, Mm -hmm. you know, to that. Because if you do, uh, if you do the workouts that I do, yeah, you could drop the sets down and drop, you know, certain things to make it work for you because you don't need to do that much volume and that much hard work to see the same results. You know, you want to do, honestly, you want to do the least amount of work for the most, you know, benefit, you know? So, I mean, some people can actually recover from, right? Exactly. Some people could go in there and do half the sets that I do and get, you know, get benefit from, they could Mm -hmm. build muscle, they can lose body fat. But for someone like me, that's been working out for so many years, I need to push myself, you know, that much harder to see results. Mm -hmm. 
So are you still working out two and a half hours a day then? No, I've dropped it down. (laughs) I mean, I've dropped down to about an hour and a half now. Uh, Now, back then, it used to be, you know, a lot more resting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I would go in there, I would, you know, go in there and work out hard, but I would not time my sets and stuff. So I would go in there and, you know, do a bench press, but then sit there, get some water and not knowing that I was taking maybe two minutes rest. Now I actually time all my rest periods so that every 60 to 90 seconds, I'm going at it again. So that workout is condensed more. It's about the same amount of volume and stuff, but it's condensed uh, so Sounds that like I can get done. a cardiovascular challenge then. Right. Too. I mean, I'm burning burning a whole lot more calories right. than if I were to, you know, rest a whole lot more. I remember in the, I think it was the um, encyclopedia, Arnold's encyclopedia, he said, you know, bodybuilders and runners, marathon runners have a lot more in common than you think. Like mm-hmm. a hard leg day of hour and a half, two hours it is a marathon in, oh, yeah. its, in its own way. Oh, know? yeah, for How do you, sure. Did you find that you had to, that just, you know, just timing your rest periods, eventually you'd catch up? Or did you have to really start prioritizing cardio more as preparation for your epic training? Uh, well, you know, cardio has its own own role. I normally will do cardio. Well, it depends on what season I'm in. You know, you have your off season, you have your, your pre-contest or pre-photo right. shoot. And no matter what throughout the year, I'm doing some sort of cardio because it's going to help your workouts as well. Right. Uh, because if your you know, cardiovascular system is not high, you're going to be suffering even just working out, period. So when I go through an off season, I'll do cardio maybe just once or twice a week max. Uh, because at that point, I'm trying to build as much muscle as possible. And for me, um, being in the fitness world where I'm trying to stay in shape, I try to stay right at like 10% or less in body fat year round. Mm-hmm. Um, so during you know the off season, I only do about two you know two max cardio sessions, and that's going to be high intensity. So it's not going to be like your two low. Per, yeah. Per two, week, two, two per week. week. Okay. Yeah, two per week. It's going to be two high intensity sessions a day, only two. Then, not, <laughs> only two. Not three. Only two. No, no, no. <laughs> no, a week. Uh-huh. So, you know, that's going to be, you know, like sprinting or something just right. to race my heart rate up there and rest. And that's only going to last around 15 to 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Now, when I'm getting into, uh, you know, pre photo shoot or contest, getting ready for anything, uh, you know, I ramp that up a whole lot where I'm doing maybe three hit sessions a week and then doing uh, low intensity, you know, the other days days of the week, mm-hmm. um, you know, just to get ready for, you know, photo shoot or trying to lose some body fat. Right. Yeah. But you do a pretty good job of kind of maintaining that, like almost always stage. Ready. Yeah. My, um, you know, different people have different genetics. My family, my dad is a rail. I mean, he's, you know, 50 years old and he's, you know, skinny. He can eat anything and stay skinny year round. So for me, even as, even as a teenager, I've always been a very hard gainer. So mm-hmm. my body likes to stay relatively in a low percent body fat. Now, as I've gotten older, I've had to watch my diet a whole lot more, of course, mm-hmm. than when I was a teenager, because I could eat you know, five burgers a day and still have abs. So that was never an issue until I got to around like maybe 25. And now I'm having to watch my diet a little bit more. But I could honestly eat like a normal person three to four meals a day, like, you know, what normal people do now, eat fast food and stuff. And I would still stay relatively lean Mm -hmm. just because my body is just naturally like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm kind of blessed in that, you know, Mm -hmm. range. So um, so did you have to then just start seeking out like, all right, how does Greg Plitt really eat? And like, you know, follow, follow the, the straight up. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I tried, I mean, that is one thing that's changed so much is my diet over the years. Now workouts have relatively stayed the same. Of course I had to, you know, every, you know, off season or when I'm getting ready for a photo shoot, that changes a little bit where my rest periods change, but All the time, my workouts have always been at the beginning of the workout, I'm going to try to lift as heavy as possible, get the compound movements in, and then throughout the workout, then I'll do more isolation movements and go for more volume and stuff. That's how my workouts have always been. Mm -hmm. Pretty classic. Yeah, pretty classic. Mm -hmm. But during the diets over the years have changed so much. I mean, because, you know, there's different research out there. I read different things. I want to try different things. And... You know, so when I first got started, it was, you know, back then it was all about drop your fats, right. super low. You know, if you want to lose body fat, you need to drop all your fats. And 
man, that tore me up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. That was a bad idea. So I would go... Just in terms of not feeling good? Not feeling good and being like um, just a natural guy and stuff. My testosterone dropped, even as, you know, being Mm -hmm. young, 20, I think it was 22 at the time or something like that. So I was, you know, know, I was new to it and I was just dieting. And so I did like a 12-week diet program and, you know, slowly just tailoring all my calories down and dropping my fats super low mm-hmm. and just felt horrible. You know, just, it was, it was a, it was not a great diet. Right. So, I mean, some people can do it just fine. You know, it just depends yeah. on who you are. So, I mean. Some people are also comfortable with feeling bad. Some people like, <laughs> right. yeah, some, some competitors really like that feeling. Uh-huh. And yeah. It's like, I, I do at the last, like the last four weeks. So if I got a photo shoot and I do, and I'm coming up to it and I don't feel bad, like four weeks mm-hmm. prior to that shoot, I feel mentally or, you know, I just don't feel like I'm ready just because I don't feel bad, which is so weird mm-hmm. to think that. Mm-hmm. You know, you could look great in the mirror, but if you don't feel bad, you feel like you could have done more, right. which is so strange. It's you know? got to be hard to get away from. Yeah, it's know. very hard to get away from. I've only had maybe like two or three preps that I feel really good throughout the whole prep. And at the end of it, you're like, wow, that wasn't all that bad. But all the rest of them, you know, it seems like, you know, you have to dig deep and you feel horrible. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Hmm. You know, so, so when did you make the switch? When did you kind of figure out that you needed fat? And now I believe you do a, a version of carb cycling. So kind yeah. of so how that four, let's see, maybe like four years ago or three years ago, I was doing research and found the diet. It's uh, carb backloading at first. Oh, the old John Kiefer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I read up on him. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if he does he do anything anymore I because I think I all the know. research kind of went kaput. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I still know people who love that who love that approach. See, so. I still mm-hmm. use it. I still use it, but it's not for me, it's not for losing body fat really. It's not like a diet program for me to lose uh, you know, tons of body fat like I used to. I used to think it was, you know, from reading all his stuff, it right. was like this major you know, mega thing that you can just drop b- body fat by just eating ultimate your carbs throughout plan, the day. Right. The ultimate cutting plan. Mm-hmm. And I found that that wasn't the case. For me, it was more all about energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in the morning, if I get up in the morning, I found that because I used to work, I used to be a personal trainer like uh, three, four years ago in a gym. So I'd wake up early in the morning, have, you know, a typical, you know, bodybuilding breakfast, oatmeal, right. uh, your protein, egg whites and stuff. And then around 11 or 12 o'clock, I felt like I needed to take a nap and I just felt horrible. I was really just drained. And so I knew that I needed to change something up. I wasn't sure what mm-hmm. that is. And about that time, I found the mm-hmm. car backloading. Which, which to be clear, it, it's like you, you restrict them really severely during the day, right? Like next to no carbs during the yeah, day. Yeah. So, and then you have them only after a certain time period mm-hmm. for people so you who are familiar with it. Right. So the car backloading, yeah, you have all your uh, healthy fats in the morning. So you have like your proteins and healthy fats, which for me, it was like coconut oil. It could be bacon. It could mm. be whole eggs. So all your, your fats are in the morning. And then you're going to go throughout the day until around, uh, for me, when I worked out in the afternoon back then, it was around maybe five o'clock. So late in the afternoon, then you work out and then you have all your carb sources after your workout Mm. and the carbs are like white rice. So anything fast absorbing, Mm. you know, cereal, all that stuff. And I found doing that, I had more energy and I thought, you know, it was amazing because I could go, you know, have my fats in the morning and have energy, you know, around 11, 12, you know, you know, throughout the whole day, have consistent energy instead of crashing. And so, you know, from there, uh, I kind of evolved from doing carb backloading to carb cycling with it as well. So uh, when I get ready for a photo shoot or anything like that, I find for energy purposes, I will go start off with like one low day. So let's say I have a 12-week prep that I'm trying to get ready for. I will do one day of very low t- to no carbs besides vegetables. So it's probably going to be around 50 below mm-hmm. on carbs. And then I will have a medium day on the second day and then a high day. Uh, the medium day will be maybe around 150 carbs. And then on the high day will be anywhere from two to 300 carbs. Mm-hmm. And then I recycle that until Just I one, stop two, losing. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, yeah. Mm-hmm. Until I hit a plateau. And then I'll, you know, follow up on the scale. The scale is not always a great way to measure that. Mm-hmm. Blunt yeah. way of measuring. But it's a great way if you do it like in maybe a two week span. And, you know, every single day, I think it's a bad idea because it's a mind game. And you're like, well, I didn't lose weight yesterday or mm-hmm. today, you know, and yesterday, or I woke up today and I was heavier. And, you know, the scale, 
it, it all changes depending on how hard you worked out even. Because okay. if you had a hot, you know, really hard leg workout the day before, you're going to be holding a lot of water in your legs. And so, you know, that could vary on, your, on the scale and it's a mind game. So for me, I like to go kind of like, you know, weigh myself like every, you know, three days or something. And then at the end of the two weeks, see where I'm at, mm -hmm. write it all down, you know, make sure you know where you're at and stuff and then change it up. So then I will do two days very low. And, you know, the other day will be like a high carb day Okay. and cycle through that. And then by the end of the prep, I go, I mean, I dig deep, but I do like three days, very low to no carbs. And on the fourth day, I will have Just the two to three hundred. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it slowly depletes your energy. You feel like right. crap by the end of that, but then you have that high carb day to give your energy, you know, you have more energy. Mm -hmm. And I like to, uh, on the high carb days with that normally when I'm going to be working the biggest muscle group. So it's going to be like legs or back. And I find for me anyways, that's the best way to keep my energy for, mm -hmm. Um, you know, throughout that prep, a lot of the times when back then I used to do like a slowly just taper and I wouldn't adjust my carbs until mm -hmm. like, you know, week or every two weeks. And I would just drop my carbs all the way down until I get to. Right. That's harder to come out of though. Yeah, too, 10. Right? And then, yeah, it's harder on your body as mm -hmm. well. And I found that I felt way worse mm -hmm. doing it, just slowly take, you know, just taking my calories down, you know, but doing it this way with carb cycling, I found that it was just easier and the calories don't change all that much, which is kind of strange. You know, the calories stay about the same, but so on the low carb days, my, my fats are going to be higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then on the high carb days, the fats are going to be lower. So the calories just adjust, you know, the macros adjust, okay. but the mm -hmm. calories pretty much stay the same mm -hmm. during that time. My proteins stay about the same throughout that whole time. So for me, it's like 260 grams of protein a day, which is a um, good amount. Yeah, it's a good Sorry. amount. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so um, now, and aside from how you feel, uh, how do you feel like your body has responded body composition wise to these things like which which of these really gave you you know th that next level in terms of being able to add more muscle or wow this is yeah, this I is do, a really successful cut yeah i mean i do the carb cycling and carb backloading even in the off season when i'm trying to build muscle so i won't in the off season, when, I, when I'm trying to build, I don't have a zero carb or, you know, just vegetable carbs. I will have like a medium day mm -hmm. and then jump up to the high day. But I constantly carb cycle because I want to keep my body fat as low as possible while trying to build muscle. Because at a certain point, if you build so much fat, all the nutrients that you're putting into your body, it's going to consistently go into fat. I think there's only so much you can do before, you know, the nutrients stop going, stops going to the muscle. Sure. And so I think even during a bulking phase, you need to have those lower, you know, calorie days or lower carb days to kind of get your body in check. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I do it year round and I, and for me, it's all about the energy. If I feel good going into the gym, that's what I want to feel like. Because if I feel crappy, I'm not going to have a very good workout. Right. So no matter what my goals are, if it's fat loss or if it's build, you know, trying to build muscle at the time, if I feel crappy, I don't want to go in there. I won't work out as hard. So I won't get the benefit. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's whatever that makes me feel best, you know, every single day, mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to do. Sure. And for me, I found that carb backloading and carb cycling is the best best way for you, you know, to bring me to do back that car backloading man i, I think back. with this podcast we're bring back. <laughs> now with that because when you're carb cycling you naturally kind of build in more cheats on those higher carb mm -hmm. days so do you ever just take a day off completely or are you do you feel like that diet because it is so sustainable just allows you to yeah i see i i don't know see a lot of people do have you know i mean i did too like the binging right. where you would have okay when you restrict your carb intake for, you know, a certain amount of days. And then on the third day or fourth day, they're like, okay, this is the only time I can have those carbs. They'll go and tear into some carbs right. and overdo carb, it. Carb backloading can be guilty of that too. Like that was- Yeah, well, carb like, backloading is big time. The, the, they, the pop tarts at night sort of plan, Yeah, well, right? that was the carb, uh, with the carb night. I carb think night, it was, that's carb right. Night, that was and it was worst, like yeah. one week. I did that. I did that for two months and found that that was the worst thing I could ever do mm -hmm. because for me- um, I couldn't handle it mm -hmm. because you would go a whole week, very low carb. So you'd pretty much go no carbs besides vegetables for seven days. And on, I think on the seventh or eighth day, mm -hmm. you could have all the carbs you wanted for that day. 
And so, you know, you deplete your energy, you know, you'd feel horrible right around maybe the fourth day, you know, so you'd start feeling, you know, drained and stuff. But then on that seventh or eighth day, you know, you could have as many carbs you want and I would pig out. I'd have mm-hmm. pop tarts every meal, you know, I would have every meal. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I would have anything like that I crave, pasta, <laughs> right. pizza, anything that I wanted. That's what I would eat. Uh-huh. And I found that mentally it was not good for me because I would just constantly think about that day, you know, coming mm-hmm. up, mm-hmm. Um, you know, okay, if I can lo- only make it to day seven and then I, I would have like <laughs> buy up, stock up things for the week. Just I would go to the gr- <laughs> grocery store and buy it, <laughs> put it in my room and be like, okay, well, this is for this Saturday. I have a date with you, Mr. Yeah. Pop-Tart. <laughs> exactly. <I can't> <laughs> <wait>. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, some people can do it if mm-hmm. you can sit there and, you know, mentally make yourself you know, like kind of watch, you know, watch how many calories you're putting in because at the end of, like I said, I did it for like two months and I look back at progress and stuff and I really didn't see much progress at all because I was trying to lose body fat at the time. That's the reason why I was doing it. And I mean, I did lose some, but it was only until I was like restricting what I was eating. And for me, after the seventh day and stuff, if I restricted on that eight, that eighth day, I felt horrible. Like I felt worse because I was like, man, I wish I would have, you know, ate that mm-hmm. when I could have, you know, I should have. And so I didn't really like that as mm-hmm. much. But now that I'm, you know, I guess gotten older, done it for so many years, it's not such a big deal for me to have, uh, if it fits into my macros, I will have, mm-hmm. uh, certain meals. So I don't feel deprived because I feel if you go on a diet and you're constantly thinking, okay, well, I can never have that donut until right. after my prep, after your prep, you're going to be, you know, you're going to gain so much unwanted body fat because mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's in your head and you, because you, you can't have it right now, mm-hmm. then your body wants it that much sure. more. Fixates on right. it. Yeah. Yeah. But so, then there's a, there's a classic approach to that too, right? Where it's that, you know, that in season, off season mentality where it's like, well, if I want to be a truly shredded 180, I have to be a truly sloppy 230 at some point, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you, I, I picture you in the library on bodybuilding.com and on the forum somewhere on, on Body Space, that, that narrative is out there, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Did you ever Did you ever bite on that? Like, all right, I guess I better just get gigantic if I'm going to get shredded. Well, the thing is, I honestly, I'm not even kidding when I said I could not get to that much weight, uh-huh. like just because my body wouldn't allow me to. I've only been over 200 pounds uh, this last uh, off season, just touched and it. Huh? You just touched it, just <laughs> like hit the two hundred. And before then, I got to like what maybe one ninety five when I was younger, and I was not athletic anymore. Mm-hmm. And I was I was out like on vacation with my family or something, and I was like rock climbing, and I couldn't rock even climbing really... at one ninety five ain't no joke. <laughs> yeah, and I realized that, and I uh-huh. realized that I was not athletic anymore, and I hated it. I could not hold my body weight like what I used to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I said at that point, I'm never going to get my body up to 200 pounds. But over the years now, I got up to 200 pounds and I you know, was able to build muscle or something. I got mm-hmm. bigger so that I was still athletic at 200 mm-hmm. pounds. Right now, you know, leaning down for photo shoots and stuff, I'm about 190. Mm-hmm. So when I got up to 200, I was not all, you know, just a lot of body fat. Right. I was, you know, so I slowly over the years – incorporated a lot more muscle. And so I'm still athletic a whole lot more than what I used to be. Sure, sure. And I think that touches on something we were talking about before we started, which is people see you now and they don't realize that you're 12 years into this. You know, that this isn't something that happened overnight. You just put a picture up and all of a sudden you're traveling the world as a fitness model. It's like... There oh yeah, they a, don't. A they don't understand. Like yeah, they don't understand how long it took me to build mm-hmm. uh, my physique. A lot of you know, every expo I go to, they come up to me and is like, "How many years have you been working out?" You know, and I'm like, you know, twelve years, and they're just like, "Oh, like," and they just walk right. off, like all depressed <laughs> and stuff. I'm like, if you want, you know, if you want to look like this, it takes time, it takes effort. You know, it's a lot of Thousands hard work. Of yeah. yeah, and if it was only, if it only took people a year or two years a lot of more people would be shredded and huge. But, you know, for me, it was never, uh, I never cared how long it would take me. It was just that that was my goal and I wanted to do that. And so it just turned into something where, you know, I, it turned into something that I love doing now and 12 years plus now I'm still doing it and still loving it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a lot of people think, 
you know, my my physique, I think that's why, um, you know, the kind of industry has changed a little bit now. Like people like Muscle Tech sponsor me. You know, they used to only sponsor the huge bodybuilders, but mm -hmm. they want people that look more obtainable like myself for marketing and stuff. But at the same time, like it's still – <laughs> right. still it's a still a lot of work to get away. Yeah. yeah. You might not have to do, go to the ex, you know, extreme levels to get to my physique, but it still takes a very long time to do that. A lot of hard work, you know, dieting all the time. Uh, you know, I've never since the 12 years have taken off from the gym more than I would say a week at all. You know, I've always, even on vacation, I'm in the gym because I love doing it. Uh, you know, so if I go to Cancun or some all inclusive vacation, I'm sitting there in the gym just about every day working out because I love doing mm -hmm. it. Uh, it's not for vain reasons anymore. I mean, sure. of course it helps, mm -hmm. but I just, I'm addicted to it. Mm -hmm. and sure. So, well, yeah, yeah. You, you can't imagine life without it at this yeah. point, I imagine. Yeah, and you exactly. have been traveling the world a lot, really mm -hmm. being an ambassador for not only muscle tech, but for muscle in general, right? Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking before the podcast about, it, you know, yeah, in China and Sweden and these places that are kind of developing fitness scenes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to it's easy to forget, like, United States, you know, you follow people on Instagram and you think, okay, yeah, pe muscular people are all over the place, but yeah. they're definitely not in the rest of the world, right? You stand out quite a bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been traveling a whole lot more recently, you know, all over the world, and you know, in the U.S., so many people get, you know, you go to the gym in the U.S. and there's so many big people. Right. You're not the biggest guy in the I'm gym. I'm not the biggest right. guy in the gym. Yeah. You don't, I don't really stand out in the gym. Now, when I start getting leaned out for a shoot and all that stuff, of course, and you stand out because it's a lot more bigger people in the gym than it is like ripped and big. Right. There's mm -hmm. a difference. But in other parts of the world, like I went to Sweden this year, China, Dubai, uh, those p those places are just now really starting to pick up in the fitness industry. And you'll go to a gym and not one person in there, you know, looks like they've been working out for more than a year, which is, you know, good. I mean, it's starting to pick right. up, but it's completely different. So uh, when you go over there being uh, really big and ripped and stuff, people look at you like, oh, my gosh, you know, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. It's like a different world. Uh, you know, China. I went over there and you're like a celebrity over yeah. there. You'd go over there and people would just like look at you like, oh my gosh, you'd walk around at the mall and you'd have a line of people just wanting to take photos with you because you're big. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we'd have, um, you know, meet and greets and we would have people stacked out the door trying to meet you because they've never met anyone with muscle like that. Hmm. Uh, you know, Were maybe, there people who followed you online or who yeah, was familiar it was a lot with of people that yeah it was a lot of people that followed you online and mm. stuff uh which was kind of different over in china for, mm. for you know because uh they have their own social medias right. so they don't have you know facebook instagram youtube mm. um but so, they mm. would still i mean they could like a lot of them still did but they're not supposed to because i went over there and had my laptop and stuff i would get on their wi-fi and i could not get on instagram i couldn't get on facebook right. youtube everything was blocked but I guess they have their own way of, you know, going through that. But so, uh, so you don't have your own profile on Chinese social media? They do. So oh, Muscle Tech, okay. yeah, a year ago when I got with them, they told me that they're going to create uh, their own, like, social media in China. Mm. Uh, so everything I produce over here in America on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, what they do is grab it, translate it all, put it in all their social media. So I have my own social medias uh, over there that I don't do myself, but they right. just reproduce it and post it. So that's how they knew me over cool. there mainly oh, was through different social medias. Um, Sweden was a little bit different. They have you know YouTube, right. Instagram, and all that stuff. So that was um, really neat going out there and meeting people out there. But it is just now really starting to pick up over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so it, it's so small over there, but you know it's the gyms are starting to grow. People are actually looking into more you know fitness now. Mm -hmm. Um, and what sort of questions were you getting in China? In China? Right. Well, it's hard to, because everyone did not speak English. Of course. Right. Like, they told me, at first, Muscle Tech was like, oh, you know, big cities, everyone speaks English. Uh -huh. China did not. Oh. <laughs> no, I would be at the hotel lost because they didn't even speak English at the, the hotel. hotel. Wow. In the hotels, yeah. even in the big cities. I was in Beijing and Shanghai. And both those are huge, you know, tourist cities and none of them spoke English. So if I wanted to do anything, I had to have a translator at all times. Mm -hmm. So when we had like a 
fit, uh, people come up and go to um, you know the expos and stuff, meet me and have meet and greets. You couldn't really ask many questions right. because they we had so many people there that upper chest, wait, upper chest. Yeah, <laughs> so we couldn't really translate everything. So it was really hard to get any kind of questions. But for the most part, everyone was you know wanting to know like how long I've been working out, okay, and all that stuff. So they just wanted to basic know like stuff. details, ba- basic right. stuff. It wasn't anything like in depth because mm-hmm. I really couldn't answer it. Hand position on flies. Yeah, right. Oh, right. <laughs> it wasn't any of you that. Say, just watch that we, Bruce Lee movie, man. It'll teach you everything bubble. you know. <laughs> We're worried about hand position on flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Bruce Lee will teach you everything you yep. need to know. Bruce Lee, just Bruce um, Lee. No, no. I, I wanted to ask you about um, this. Either is it new fit or new fit? This thing. New this, fit. New fit. Okay. Uh-huh. Maybe I like Germany too much. <laughs> I want to call it new fit. There's, there's this stim unit I've been seeing you use a lot yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on social media recently. It looks it looks pretty interesting. I just wanted to know how you got involved with that and how different that is in terms of how it feels and and the results you feel like. There is different. nothing like it. Uh, so about a year ago I or two years ago I moved to Austin Texas from Memphis Tennessee and so I moved out to Austin um, like I said just about two years ago and uh, about a year ago when I was in Austin I started having shoulder issues I had some rotator cuff issues and I was getting ready for some photo shoots and uh, so I was having some really bad shoulder pain and I was telling some people at the gym, uh, some friends at the gym that I was having this real bad pain. And they told me that you need to go see these people at New Fit. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll go in there, mm-hmm. you know, check it out or something. So he contacted the main guy in there and the guy was like, hey, come in, uh, I'll take a look at your shoulders, but we have some other things that we want you to look at and stuff. Uh, for training and I he was trying to explain mm. to me over the phone what this is and uh, you know I've done I've done the tens unit and stuff right. that little machine yeah. that kind of just and that's what it sounded purposes, like yeah for right. recovery mm-hmm. and stuff and that's what it sounded like because I own one of those at the house so I was like okay this is strange so he couldn't really explain to me very well you know what it was he you know he told me but I just wasn't getting it so I went in and he worked on my shoulder for for a while And, you know, just like doing a lot of pressure points and all that stuff. And then he had that machine and he would rub it all over my body to figure out where like it would like have this certain pain uh, worse than others. So he would mark it or something. And then he would go around and kind of just work on those muscles. At the end of it felt great. And he was like, okay, well, that was the, you know, that was trying to re, you know help your shoulder. Now, do you want to train with these things on? He's like, let's do legs or something. I was like, okay. So they, uh, he took me in the back. And there's a full gym. And that that's not what I was expecting. I was you know, like thinking, you know, they would hook it up and I would just sit there with it on. He was right. like, no, you actually work out with these electrodes mm-hmm. on your body. So what they do is hook you up to these electrodes and they turn this machine on. Cuff, right? Yeah, it's like little pads everywhere. So let's say I did it on a leg. So he's, you know, padding up my quads and my hamstrings and my glutes. And he turns this thing on. And so I did a full workout and uh, about, I think it took, 45 minutes and this after this particular workout I did and I did nothing but body weight stuff so no weight I was doing like wall sits and wall squats Mm -hmm. and like just like no weight leg extension so all I would do is just like lift my leg and squeeze up at the top with these electrons because it makes you squeeze they say up to like I don't know 100 to 200 times harder than Mm -hmm. what you can um, on your own. And at the end of that workout, I felt like I did a two to three hour leg workout. So I was like, and I was sore Mm -hmm. for, I'm not even kidding. A week after I could not walk the next day. (laughs) It was so bad. So I was like, there's something to this. And so they say, you know, that, that machine actually hooks, uh, you know, you hook it up. And like I said, it makes you contract those muscles so much Mm -hmm. more than what you can naturally cables and stuff hanging off of cables and yeah, hooks straight up to that machine. Mm And, um, you know, so it makes you just contract uh, and you don't have to use as much weight as you would if you were using, you know, like without it. So, right. you know, f- so it's good for helping injuries and stuff because you have to drop the weight by literally right. half mm-hmm. uh, to get, you know, to even lift the weight because it just locks you up almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a different kind. So like I was saying, the TENS unit, it's a different kind of currency. So the TENS unit, they say you can't actually work out through the current because you'll end up tearing your muscle because it's fighting. So all it does is like tenses the muscle and releases it. This machine actually uses the same current that your brain uses to fire your muscles. And so okay. that is why you're able to contract throughout that 
you know, the mm. currency. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's very interesting. And I've been doing it for over a year now. Mm-hmm. And with have, weights as well as with body weights. Weight. So I'll go in there and strap those things on now and squat with weights uh, or, you know, bench press everything. I mean, every muscle group I will have like, you know, doing bench press or anything. So you actually use weight with this thing on. Hmm. So you're getting the benefit of using, you know, you know, weight plus the machine. So I've seen major muscle gain with this, you know, with nothing else changing. So I know it has to help. Mm. And if you look, if you go online and look this up, new fit, it, um, it's still marketed primarily as a, rec- as a recovery right. tool. It is because um, the machine so, so is, are you sort of like their Frankenstein, like, Ooh, now exactly. we get, now we get to experiment <laughs> exactly. they, on a real yeah, body. Because they've been doing it. They've been training themselves and stuff on it for years and stuff, because like you said, it was for recovery. It's for, uh, people going in there with like a torn muscle or something. And, uh, they're having to, let's say, they had a tour torn like you know chest or something they're going to go in there and get the work done uh to kind of help that you know the muscle to recover and stuff hmm. uh but over the years they've been training themselves and so they wanted me to come in so that they could actually kind of do like a research to see how this could work in bodybuilding and uh, now it's been going global. They, you know, they have people. They've been helping all kinds of big athletes, like baseball players, to pro bodybuilders, come in there now to go in there and you know give this a shot, and they love it uh, because it's something that you know a lot of times you know a lot of people haven't seen before. Right. Yeah. And you know you can't really understand the feeling until you actually get hooked up to this thing mm. i tell people all the time like you can watch my videos and stuff but you don't understand pain until you get under this machine and for me <laughs> i love that mm-hmm. uh, you know because when i did it that leg day it hurt insane bad but i loved it so I, ever since that day i was like okay well i'm addicted right. because right. if i if it works i'm going to keep doing it mm. And it, and it does. How and is that? It, how is that different in terms of the sensation or how it feels uh, afterward from doing BFR blood flow restriction training, which I've also right. seen you do? Yeah. So I still do blood flow. Restri- I even do blood flow with that machine. Oh on really? As well. Oh my god! So it's like god. combination is just <laughs> unreal, unreal. The I don't know. The pain in the soreness is different. Mm-hmm. Like this soreness is they. I mean, it's like. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Punch the mic. Uh, no, the pain is like to the bone. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, you're sore forever. Uh, so still, even you keep doing this and you're still getting that. I'm soreness. still sore. Yeah, like even uh, well, I haven't been there because I've been traveling right. so much these past weeks. So I'm gonna go in there this Monday, oh, and I man. promise you, you oh, yeah, I'll be sore for, for over a, you know a week and stuff. <laughs> and you know, you have to. I really mentally have to tell myself, okay, I need to calm down. I don't need to work out that hard when I'm in a cut. Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm very low calories or something, because at that point I get too sore and I'm sore for over a week. And at that point I am overdoing it, right. but I love doing it when I'm trying to build muscle, when I'm having more calories, because I can, um, recover faster because if you don't have the calories going in and you do this, these, those super hard workouts at new fit and stuff, I mean, it, it makes my other workouts, you know, it hinders my other workouts. Mm. Like if I go in there, and even do, I'm not even kidding when I say I go in there and do legs and do my calves and I go the next like two days later trying to do shoulders. That even hurts because getting the dumbbells off to <laughs> launch them up, I can't do it. I'm uh, not kidding when I cannot walk literally muscle. because I mean, my calves are so sore. Yeah. That's really interesting because, I mean, you think of something like a stim unit, even if it's a totally different kind of stim unit, it's not the sort of thing that's really going to boost muscle damage, you would right. think, right? Mm-hmm. So is it like, I mean, is, is just the pump and the contraction so intense that it's giving like the muscle damaging from inside? Like it's exploding? They say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what it's doing is tearing up more muscle fibers. It, it actually does succeed. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Interesting. And really, mm-hmm. bodybuilding is the perfect market for that because I can't think of another group of people that would willingly go through so much pain. Oh yeah, for, for sure. Something um, like that. You exactly, know? exactly. And before you know, before then, it was all about trying to help people recover, get that mm-hmm. uh, that motion back. So mm-hmm. you know, if someone tore their bicep, they hook up that machine where it makes that muscle contract. So it teaches that muscle to contract again. 
Uh, so those people are willing to go through pain because they want to see their they arm work again. Right. Right. But then uh, then they found out that it could work on bodybuilders as well. And mm-hmm. people, you know, bodybuilders want to go through that pain. You know, if you're like me, that's wanting to see results and stuff, you don't mind going through some major pain if it's a good kind of pain. You know, of course, right. if I'm going in there and tearing muscles and stuff because of this thing, then I would never do it. Mm-hmm. But what's great about it is what I was saying is, you know, you're able to use lighter weight but get the same benefits. And that's the same thing with blood flow restriction. That's why it's so great is because when you do blood flow, you want to drop the weight by half and then, at least. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. at least, and then you know, go for the pump. So you're not, you know, running the risk of using extremely heavy weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're in a low percent body fat, low calories, you know, you have to really watch that or you're going to end up tearing muscles if you go in there and just go crazy heavy weight. Uh, because, you know, when you're in the off season, when you're having tons of calories, your body can recover a whole lot more. So you're able to lift heavier weight throughout, you know, the duration of your workout. But when you're, you know, lower calories and stuff, you know, you really kind of in the back of your mind, you really have to pay attention to your body so you don't hurt yourself because that's the main goal. If you hurt yourself, you know, that's going to put you way behind months behind years behind. So for me, I just try to stay injury free, Sure, you know, and that's the main, main carb cycling or something as well. Yeah. I mean, having an epic heavy arm day is pretty different than, all right, you know, I can have a pretty efficient BFR Mm -hmm. biceps and triceps day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of being willing to go through pain, we should probably talk about your, your (laughs) ab program that you're here for. (laughs) So, so, um, I, I'm sure you get, you get asked about abs all the time. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, historically, how often have you trained them and what's been your approach that you feel like has been the most, most successful for you? Well, I went through all different programs with abs. So, uh, back, you know, years back when I first started, started getting into fitness and stuff, wanted to see my abs, I worked my abs every single day, pretty much Mm -hmm. because, you know, back then it was like, okay, well, you know, abs are one of those muscles that can recover very quickly. So I would work them after every single workout for about 15 to 20 minutes. And so that would either be, you know, lying leg raises, crunches, all those things. I would do all different, you know, movements, but I would do them every day. Um, And then later on, I did that for like three years. I I saw tons of results, you know, doing that. I mean, I was able to build muscle. There is a case for that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there's a case for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wasn't using like really heavy, you know, weight or anything. So I wasn't like doing like anything crazy where I was like sore Mm -hmm. for, you know, because if I do the ab workouts that I do now, and if I did that every single day, it would be completely different because I found the best results was actually using heavier weight and working the abs just like any other muscle group. Uh, So that meaning, you know, doing in the 12 to 15 rep range, actually using some resistance. Now, some exercises, you don't have to use, you know, weight to get 12 reps, 15 reps. Like, you know, a lot of people can't do hanging leg raises more than 12 reps anyway. So that's, for that's to me, considered, you know, you, working any other mus- like working any other muscle group, still lifting weight. I mean, yeah, you're lifting weight. Yeah, enough. right, exactly. Or doing like sit ups and stuff. A lot of people mm-hmm. can't even do like a true, you know, on a decline bench, do true sit ups mm-hmm. for more than those amount of reps. So I would consider that being weighted. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is where I really found the benefits in my abs, getting the you know big. Um, chills little abs. Right, but the a difference of, between like, oh, I think I see one versus, right. oh, uh-huh. there they are. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, I see, yeah. Uh-huh. So now what's amazing is now that, you know, over the years building up my abs, my core, I'm able to go higher percent of body fat, live in a higher percent body fat, but you can still see my abs mm-hmm. just about year round, even when I'm in my off season because of how big my abs are now, because mm-hmm. I built, you know, bigger abs. Now, back then when I was younger, when they're not well-developed, I would have to be pretty low body fat to actually see them because a lot of people get confused. You know, they think that if they want abs, they're going to have to go in there and do crunches all day long and they can somehow lose body fat around their abs. No, that's going to come from overall body fat right. loss. Uh, and then you got to think, you know, body fat is a different tissue than muscle. Mm-hmm. 
So I don't know, you know, a lot of when you're new to it, I mean, I was the same way. I was thinking, okay, back then, if I crunch, all that fat is going to turn into, you're just going to you know, chew muscle it up somehow. It's just going to convert. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to convert. Exactly. And that's what yeah. a lot of people think, mm-hmm. you know. And then over the years, of course, I found out, I was like, oh, well, yeah. you know, it has nothing to do with it, you know. And so I found that working abs, like any other muscle group, let it recover mm-hmm. uh, is the best way to, you know, still more results. frequently than, say, legs yeah, more or back. Fr- yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. More free. So this yeah. is a, this is a, a two a on, muscle right? Group, so. This is a two on, one off two program. Two on, one off. So you end up doing abs four to five days a week, mm-hmm. which is a lot of volume for yeah. abs. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a specialization program too, to yeah. a certain degree, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's for a particular amount of time and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, any program that I do or anything, even other muscle groups, I will go really high volume for, you know, like they call it an overreaching phase, you know, so you really just pound out your body uh, and then you give it like a recovery phase, you know, and that's with any muscle group. So if I'm wanting to build, you know, let's say my quads, I'm going to pound it out super hard for a given amount of time and then letting them rest. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's great to do, you know, I think that four week sort of one month time frame is a good, a good overreach. Yeah. I mean, I think so. And I mean, sometimes, I mean, overreaching can be, you know, if you do like a phase for even a week or something, that's for more like huge muscle groups, you know, that's more Mm -hmm. for like your legs or back or something, you know, but for like your abs and your calves, smaller muscle groups, your arms, you can work those a whole lot more and overreach a whole lot more before they just say, you know, enough's enough. Right. I'm excited for this. We should do this as a challenge because I've never actually had abs before. <laughs> you, you were a... You can look at the pictures. I didn't, have, I didn't have abs. Like I'm a, <laughs> I'm a hard gainer in the abs and the calves. Like I can't, okay. I don't get... Heavy abs. weight. Calves, calves. Heavy weight. Yeah. We, need, we need to have a uh, like a cable curl <laughs> powerlifting competition. <laughs> see who, <laughs> I don't know, you get pulled back so if you get thrown through the roof, I could see. <laughs> have, yeah. you, have you tried the new fit on your abs? Oh yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Oh my Which god. Really, you, you can't leave the bed if your abs don't work. Though. Yeah. Uh, really, it's you know I don't know if you've ever heard of the machines that you know they hook up to men to get the same contraction that like when you're in pregnancy. Oh no, <gasps> no. But that sounds that's like, exactly that's exactly what it is. Wow. I mean because your your abs just squeeze so hard that you just <laughs> lock up and that's exactly and you thought what you're the, having a baby. Like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so so what when you when you hook it up it's all you know, so what do you do? Uh, you can just sit there and let the contractions so they can do what it, what it does. They can have it like different ways. They can have the current, the, uh, the frequency, uh, like just go through the motion so you can go for, um, it just, it's just on. So you can either do ab rollouts, you can do crunches, or they can turn it on where it's a five second, five second contraction. And then it like, yeah. And then it pauses for five seconds. So it releases. So at that okay. point you would want to do like a crunch, hold it for those five seconds uh-huh. or sit up and then go back down during the releasing phase. Huh. And you feel like it touches the oh. deep abs as well, or just oh, yeah. more superficial? Yeah, I mean, you can hook it up all over. So the obliques, oh. the abs and everything. Uh, I, I don't uh, know. It sounds to me a little bit like that uh, scene in the princess bride where they have them hooked up to the machine. And they just <laughs> oh yeah. It up uh-huh. and up. <laughs> now I don't work abs as much as what I, you know, I guess, I don't work in as much at New Fit, right? Just because it makes me so sore that your core muscles, your abs, um, you need them for everything. You need them for throughout yeah. the breathing. Week. <laughs> yeah, you need them throughout the week. So if I go in there and do a deadlift deadlift session, I need those to be not just deathly sore, you know, right. because that's going to be, you know, and then same thing with squatting. Mm-hmm. It uses your core a whole lot. So I don't need to be completely just dead throughout the week because it is going to mess up my other workouts. Yeah. That is one of the cautions of, of working too hard or overtraining is that yeah. your body moves around pain and that's mm-hmm. when you get injured. Right. So you have to mm-hmm. be very careful. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. So so what's next for you then? You've been traveling. Now you're back. What, what's the next uh, What's the next plan? Uh, the next plan. So I get back, uh, let's see, this Saturday. And then the next week we have Muscle Tech coming to my house. They're doing like a Why, Why I Lift campaign. So they're going to come out there and film kind of how I got started, uh, what I'm doing now. So kind of just my life cool. in general there in Austin. They'll be out there for like three to four days. Uh, and then I'm going to be going back to China Um I think the next month uh, and then a whole lot of different photo shoots and stuff. This is when I try to, when I'm leaned up, try to do all my photo shoots and everything for pretty much the rest of the year and mm-hmm. stuff. And then I pretty much have to stay in shape until about August or September. Uh, so I get in shape for like March and then stay in shape until about mm-hmm. 
you know, September ish. Mm-hmm. And then I'll have that off season where, you know, holidays and stuff. It's a great time to have like that off season. Sure. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, spending time with family and stuff, it's a good balance. You know, you got to have that balance in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a lot of traveling right now. Okay. Um, I really enjoy it. It's just, I mean, a lot of people, uh, we were talking earlier and we we're saying how a lot of people get this mindset that is just so easy, you know, having this life and stuff. And right. I'm not complaining. I love it. This is what I wanted to do. This is what I love doing, but it is tough. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. When you go to expos all day long and still have to do cardio in the morning for 40 minutes, then you have to go work out afterwards. And then by the time you get back to your hotel, you're going, you know, five in the morning all the way up until nine o'clock at night. And then when you get back, I have to edit videos because, you know, it's all about social media these days. So I have to constantly work on that. And then I'm up until 11 o'clock, go to sleep and start all over again at five, eight, you know. So the max I've finally this week have actually been amazing because I've been getting around seven hours of sleep Mm -hmm. and that's the most i've been getting in months now because it's just you know you when you do all that you have to you know you have to train still so no matter how long your days are at expos meeting Mm -hmm. people doing photo shoots video shoots i still have to go train myself and do cardio because if i don't you know that's my job. Right, exactly. <laughs> now it's my job, so it's that much more pressure. So mm-hmm. The nice uh, thing about coming to bodybuilding.com is we make you do like five workouts a day. Oh, yeah, so for the good. past two days, yeah. I've already done six <laughs> workouts. Yeah. <laughs> so you're ahead, <laughs> you're ahead a few days. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Abel, thank you for coming and talking with us. Oh, yeah, uh, thank, thank you. y'all. Uh, where, so where do we find you aside from the Chinese government social media? Oh, yeah, no, no. You can find me on Instagram at Abel Body Gym. Mm-hmm. Facebook and YouTube is just Abel Albanetti. Okay, great. And look for 30 days to your best abs on bodybuilding.com all access soon as well thanks for chatting with us oh yeah awesome